G'day everybody, where's Wally here? Well, I'm going off-piste. Found something a little bit different to have a go at. This is In a Flat World by Globusters, and this was a presentation, I think, by John the Morgyle. So, let's get into it. There we go, and you are presenting. Okay, cool. So, I'm just going to talk about solar eclipses a little bit. Um, to me, this is a huge thing. So in order for a solar eclipse to occur, and we're just strictly focusing on the globe Earth model, forget flat Earth for a minute here. So during a solar eclipse, there's a few very specific things that need to happen. Um, the moon has to be aligned to the sun and the Earth upon the ecliptic plane. Yeah, you're right. And of course, according to the globe model, I don't know why it's not letting me scroll down, but they claim that the moon's orbit is uh, five degrees offset to the ecliptic plane. So that's sort of represented by this little diagram here. Yeah, you're right again. That really doesn't come into play because, again, the only time that an eclipse is going to occur is when the moon is, in fact, aligned to the ecliptic plane. Yes, too right. So if the moon is on its high divergence, you know, north of the ecliptic plane, it's never going to be able to create an eclipse. It's not possible, uh, especially because the globe earthers have really painted themselves into a corner where, you know, you have the umbra penumbra thing going on where the sun, uh, you know, the sun's rays create sort of a stylish point where the moon has to transit that one single point. There's no leeway. It has to be right there. Whoa. Say what now, John? No, there is leeway. We got leeway. See all these eclipses? not at all the same latitude yes why because we've got leeway and so on this diagram we're looking at it from sort of like a orth orthogonal view a profile view so we're sitting in the ecliptic plane looking at the system but it also goes from like a top-down view so this one here we're looking at the north pole from above same diagram actually works and you have this same effect where the moon has to be at this specific point nope no way. We got leeway that way too, John. But the effect of that is that the eclipse happens at a different time. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. And so yeah. long and short, here's the problem. Um, according to the Ball Earth model, the only time that a solar eclipse could ever occur is exactly at high noon. And that's a pretty bold statement, but um, if you look at this diagram here, sort of the 24-hour clock overlaid above the Earth, the only time that the moon is going to transit this point is when the sun is at the highest point in the sky, when it's high noon, according to the little observers here on Earth. And unfortunately for the ball, that isn't the case. Um, solar eclipses happen at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., sometimes in the evening, sometimes at noon. But the fact that they don't always only ever happen at noon is a big, big problem for the globe. Well, that was a lot of problems for the globe you have there, John, but it's a pity. It's not at all true. So, John, have a look at the eclipse map for 2021 to 2040. Why does every eclipse have an asterisk? Why is every asterisk roughly in the middle of the path? Okay, the asterisk is the GP of the noon position. This is the GP of totality, which is directly overhead. Notice how almost every eclipse has one. And notice how many paths just end in the middle of apparently nowhere. When it ends, that is the eclipse being visible at dusk or dawn. Because you're not going to see it at night, are you, John? Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's, that's absurd. Um, another thing back up to this first diagram is the solar eclipses could only ever occur within the tropical areas. Because, well... Again, the, although they say that the moon transits from tropic to tropic, it would have to be aligned to the ecliptic plane to achieve the conditions necessary for an eclipse. So it's aligned or roughly aligned such that the shadow from the moon hits the surface of the Earth somewhere on the Earth. The shadow does sometimes land on either pole. How about that? Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. And depending on the season, you know, you might have it northern summer, so the ecliptic planes aligned with the Tropic of Cancer, or maybe it's southern summer, the ecliptic planes aligned to the Tropic of Capricorn, or anything in between. So here's the big problem, though. Uh, the, the next big problem. Um, eclipses occur just all over the place. Um, here is, this is just 1980 through 1999 uh, eclipse signatures. 
Um, I think the red ones are annular and the blue ones are total, but it's th the same conditions are necessary. So again, it would have to be dead on balls at high noon, dead on balls, the ecliptic plane. And um, what you can see here is like this eclipse signature, this is a total, it transits the literal Antarctic. Uh, so does this one here, same thing happens in the north where you have, again, here's about your tropics around 30-ish. Really eclipse signatures should be um, confined to the tropics. Nope, look at it this way. The shadow of the moon can be cast anywhere on the globe by simply varying the degree of misalignment, just by a smidge up or down which is exactly what happens. You can see that by where all the signatures fall. But also, why the tropics? That's the extent of the GP of the sun, not the moon. You guys really don't understand this much at all, do you? Let me ask you, what's the furthest north or south that the GP of the moon can be? The answer is sometimes 28.5 degrees and sometimes 18.5 degrees. Okay, hear that pop? And I just totally brain farted. That was some fatty's brain cells just exploding. So why is it not even consistent, like the sun is always 23.4 degrees north and south? There's a thing called the precession of the lunar inclination plane that takes 18 and a bit years to go through its cycle. So at the maximum, the lunar inclination of 5 degrees adds to the Earth inclination of 23.4, giving it 28.5. Nine and a bit years later, those 5 degrees subtract from the 23.4, giving it 18.5 degrees. How about that? Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. And yet we see them all over the place, definitely not just at noon. And so what, what my point here is that the solar eclipses and their signatures just absolutely demolish the ball earth theory. Uh, again, because they don't happen just only at noon. They don't happen just only in the tropical areas. Straw man alert. That is your conjecture you're debunking. The real world knows eclipses happen all over the globe. Just have a look where they were from the year 1000 to the year 2000. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. And if you look into these, it's really, really interesting, man, because if you start to sort of humor these uh, eclipse signatures in a flat Earth model, it, it really makes you wonder, God, what the hell are the sun and the moon, man? When you see how the signatures at the North Pole and the South Pole are both stretched due to the scaling from the projection, makes you wonder, what are you thinking that the flat world is, man? How can this work, man? Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. I mean, there's a big mystery up there, but I think when we really dig deep and start studying, uh, studying the eclipses, it's going to um, yield a lot of answers. Yeah, you lot have all the questions and we have all the answers. But I do have just one question for you. Why are you still flatting? Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. Now, Another big, huge problem with the ball earth theory and eclipses is the shadow of the moon. Oh, I have a feeling this is going to be hilariously funny. Go on, John, misunderstand away. Um, so during eclipses, the shadow of the moon, when it hits the earth here, it's usually like 50 or 100 miles in diameter. On record, there's been about three or four in history that we've been keeping track of where the shadow of the moon, the totality is like two miles in diameter. Infinitely smaller, John, infinitely smaller. So that's the direct shadow of the moon, two miles in diameter. Okay, now you're talking about an object that is allegedly 2000 miles in diameter, some quarter million miles away, with a light source, you know, 100 million miles away, casting a shadow that's two miles in diameter. Um, this is tantamount to holding up a basketball in front of a light source and having the basketball cast a shadow that's like a quarter inch in diameter. Um, it's it's frankly it's ridiculous. It's absurd. Um, the, yeah, the and, and not only that, it, when you when you flip it over, John, if you you know when you look at the moon's shadow across the uh, Earth versus the Earth's shadow across the moon, they're they're not even remotely close. There should be basically a four to one difference in the ratio. They're not even close, not even in the same ballpark. Well, that's a nice lead into my final video, John. I'll put a pin in that comment for later. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I and mean, that's begging the question that it is the Earth's shadow hitting the moon. And of course, that's the assumption. That well, we in have the heliocentric model. <laughs> right. We have to go with that assumption, humoring the heliocentric model. And, you know, I, I get a lot of flack from ball earthers. I wonder why you get so much flack. 
Maybe it's because you're saying so many dumb things. Yes, it's definitely that. But I digress. For really scrutinizing and debunking the heliocentric model using observations like eclipses and such, the thing is, you know, with science, and I'm not going to call any of these experiments, but I will say that it is in the vein of the scientific inquiry, um, they'll, they'll all tell you and they'll make fun of you if you don't know this, but science will never prove a positive. You know, science can only ever disprove things. You can only prove a negative. And so what better way to apply our inquiry than to skeptically scrutinize and try to debunk the globe Earth model? Because the, here's the thing. If it's true, which is true, then you can never debunk it. Right. I mean, the truth cannot be debunked. There's no contradictions if something's true. And you are yet to debunk it so far. All you have done is fail. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. And right. yet, contrarily, if something is false, it's if it's a if it's a fallacy, then you're necessarily going to find discrepancies and problems with it. And so, you know, to, to the people that say, "Oh, you're you're not allowed," and I've I've had this said to me, "You're not allowed to debunk the globe Earth anymore. Just go on proving flat Earth." You really should do some proving of flat Earth. So far, debunking globe Earth has just been a massive fail for you. Right. You know. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. Um, if we show time and time again that the Earth isn't a spinning ball and the observations that we have of things like eclipses don't work in your model. Ah, uh, but they do. I mean, how can they go around saying that they have a working model when... Because globe Earth is the only working model. You know, again, the, the moon's shadow being two miles in diameter, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say... Are you sure you want to go out on that limb, John, when Where's Wally is right behind you? Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. That that is indicative, unless there's some really weird lensing effects going on that, you know, we're not aware of. And, and this would be more pertinent to a flat Earth discussion. Or geometry that you are not aware of, you know, triangles and such. Um, the moon is relatively small and local. Now, I've had estimates or I've heard estimates using trigonometry and such that the sun and moon are, you know, three to four thousand miles in altitude, some 30 miles in diameter. And that, that may be the case. It's definitely not the case. I just have uh, trouble uh, adhering to a 30 mile diameter object casting a shadow that's only two miles in diameter. What's the bet he doesn't get this right? Um, I would say that the smallest the shadow's ever been of the moon during an eclipse is probably your best indicator of the actual size, angular size of the moon. Um, so what about 50 miles? Thanks, Bob, but that is 50 miles too much. Well, perhaps the moon's as little as two miles in diameter. Because again, there have been eclipses where the shadow of the moon, the totality, was just two two miles what about the smaller ones there have been smaller ones infinitely smaller miles oh really i didn't know that yeah. wow because yeah. i you know the one in august of 2017 was uh 70 miles right yeah that's what it normally is and again uh it's it's not the norm that proves anything here it's the extremes and so far you have failed to correctly identify the limits yeah whatever man i mean that's that's absurd Right. And when you get to something extremely small as two miles in diameter and I could I could find the dates, I probably should have pulled those up. But um, you can find a lot of real good information on the Facebook page. It's called the five thousand dollar NASA Eclipse Challenge that my friend put together. Oh, um, yes. But those three dates are in there where it leaves you scratching your head like, wow, how small and how local is the moon with a minimum size of zero? How small must the moon be, John? So let's take this a whole next step further, shall we? See this eclipse on the 14th of November 2031. See how it's red and then blue and then red again? Are you thinking that Fred Espinek couldn't decide what color to use, or is this a hybrid eclipse? It has both annular and total eclipse elements to it. Very cool. The distance to the point where the penumbra disappears is around 108 times the distance of the blocking object. I'll get to that a little bit later. To create a hybrid eclipse, the distance from the moon to the shadow where it hits the ground has to be both greater than 108 times to make an annual eclipse and less than 108 times to make a total eclipse. Interesting. Now, as the moon is traveling at 90 degrees to the line between the sun and the earth, 
how are the distances to the shadow at the sunrise and the sunset greater than at noon? Here's how. The difference is R, the radius of the Earth. Do you get what's happening there, guys? I reckon that's my three Bitcoin right there, don't you? I'll tell you what, I'll split it with anyone who's prepared to go and collect it from dearth. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. And, and of course, you know, the angular size of the moon can be um, changed according to our observation point, you know, based on atmospheric lensing and things like that. But shadows, man, I have a hard time resolving that because when you're dealing with a single light source like the sun and a single um, obstructing object like the moon, um, I hate to say, but shadows are very predictable. Very predictable, John. But before you go trying, you need to realize that the sun is not a point source of light. It's actually larger than the moon. That changes everything. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's, that's absurd. Um, shadows only ever are at least as wide in terms of angular size as the obstructing object. Um, when you're dealing with a single light source and a single obstructing object, you can't demonstrate in reality a situation where that shadow gets smaller and smaller. Well, the thing is, when you start to remove that sheet of paper, which is the Earth in our analogy, further and further away from the obstructing object, um, at best, it's going to stay the same angular size as the obstructing object. And, and at worst, it's going to continue increasing in, in apparent angular size. That's, that's just how light and shadows work. That is all true for a light source that is smaller than the obstructing object, but we have a moon which is smaller than the sun, which means the sun's diameter is larger than the moon, which means the moon is a smaller blocking object. Here, let me show you how this works. I did this very scientifically. So here is the Penumbrulator 2020. This is the ultimate in umbra penumbra experimentationalisms. It has four disks to cast a shadow. So let's go and measure these discs exactly so we know what the diameter is that we're working with. These lids are from my mint jelly jars, so they're all exactly the same size of 66 point... Oh, yikes! So now the 66.7 millimeter discs are at 18, 54, 126 and 270 centimeters respectively. Now for those playing at home, that is the doubling of the distance between each disc each time. Okay, so I just stood the thing up in the sun and I lined it all up on the uh, little Skywatcher mount and I pointed it directly at the sun. So anyway, okay to the data measuring. I just love the way Mr. Sensible did this, so I did exactly the same thing. I too just used the flood fill tool to make a defined edge at a constant level of black-white. It was good to discriminate using that. So looking at DSCN 5259, I rotated the image a little bit to square it up, and then I cropped off some of the rubbish. And then I did a flood fill of the white paper. Then I filled all the umbras as well, and I recorded the pixel diameters for both the inner and the outer annulus. Then I subtracted them to get the annulus size in pixels. So once I had the inner and the outer diameters, I popped these into a spreadsheet, converted them to millimeters, and plotted that on a graph. Now you see here the orange line is at the 66.7 blocking object diameter and notice how the penumbra and the umbra both diverge away from 66.7. That's exactly what we'd expect to see. Now let's have a look at some maths. The math shows us that the umbra will only extend to around 107, 108 times the blocking object diameter when the light source is the sun. It has to be bigger than the blocking object for this to work. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. And the, the fact that eclipses just completely don't jive with the ball earth theory is just another one of these... Straw man? Well, that's what you're making here, John. Huge things uh, for flat earthers. You know, people uh, out there friends, family members, layman's on the street, you know, they like to make fun of flat earthers because, you know, we're science denying morons and we don't understand physics. Yep, that's it. Well, not because you don't understand, but because you claim you do understand while showing that you don't understand. Do you understand? But the thing is, you know, I've been preaching this for years, but the, the opposite of that is true. Uh, flat earthers are some of the smartest, you know, most intelligent, diligent. Stop, stop, John. Diligent? Really? You lot do not research despite preaching, do your own research. 
So tell me if you have done the research, why am I having to correct you with just simple facts from Wikipedia, the lowest level of research? I did not even need to do a deep dive on this one, John. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. Um, and just good people that you'll ever meet. And sort of as a rule, people that cling to the ball earth are just just terrible to deal with, man. I mean, it's really tough to deal with somebody that uh, refuses to humor an argument. You mean wants to do peer review? Because they feel that it is beyond the capacity for reality to hold. And, you know, science, if anything, is to test theories. It's to test hypothesis and try to disprove the reigning theories because Exactly your theory right now. As soon as you publish, it's open for peer review. Flat Earth does not want to be peer review. They do not want to do peer review. So few flatties watch Globe Earth videos, as Ranty correctly pointed out. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's, that's absurd. You'll only ever get closer to the truth by trying to disprove something. Okay, here, get close to the truth. Sure. Here's a video that shows the ISS from the ground. This gem came from my good mate Astronomy Live. Link is in the description as always. So tell me, John, how is it that the ISS is being faked? We see it with a telescope. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. Um, either you will find that it is wrong, and science has been wrong about all sorts of things, or you will find just how right it is, and you'll find lots of points to corroborate it. And if you actually give, you know, the topic of flat earth a fair shake and, and you skeptically scrutinize the globe. It turns out all evidence is for the globe. Um, you'll find time and time again that, that flat earth kicks the globe's ass. I mean, it, it really does. Hands down, I mean. Oh, OK. You mean in shooting in one's own foot department? There's, uh, there's no other uh, explanation for so many observable facts of nature other than the earth is flat. I would like to see one, just one, that can only be explained correctly by the Flat Earth model. Now, again, and finally, um, when you start to sort of analyze eclipses in a Flat Earth model, it really makes you wonder, what the hell are the sun and moon? Makes me wonder, what the hell is the Flat Earth model? Um, I'm convinced that neither the sun nor the moon are physical, spherical objects flying around in space. So you're convinced wrong, then? Got it. I mean, nope. I reserve that possibility, but I, I've uh, really sort of um, resigned myself to the um, to the understanding that uh, the sun and moon are m more or less like uh, electromagnetic anomalies. Anomalies, just like the millions and millions of other anomalies we see in these deep field telescope images. Yeah, whatever, man. I mean, that's that's absurd. Um, probably or likely with their source of power being the Earth itself. Well, and, anomalous uh, to our science only. I mean, obviously, right. <laughs> whatever technology they're using, it's far beyond anything we have. Okay, Bob, thanks. I think technology? Next you will be saying the sun is solar-powered or something. Yeah, <laughs> that is nuts. Well, absolutely. And, and I guess, yeah, I, I use that term loosely in terms of ano uh, anomaly. I guess what I mean is um, we here on the physical plane of reality. The surface of the earth is what we call it, John. There are very specific physical rules that physical objects must follow, must adhere to. Um, but when it comes to the sun and the moon and the celestial lights, uh, they exist in a completely different plane. That's a whole lot of magical thinking, John. The moon is just a huge ass rock. You call wall? No, not now, Hugh. Oh. Um, they exist in the astronomical plane or the, or the celestial plane, which, as far as I can tell, is very much non-physical. Um, it doesn't appear that they have to adhere to laws of time and, and physical laws as you know we are bound to here in reality. Word salad much? And uh, once we can understand, or the more that we understand, we really know nothing, especially in the mainstream veins of science, the better off we are and the better place we are starting off the true quest for truth. And maybe one day, hopefully within our lifetimes, the true frontier, which is all directions away from the center of our little realm, our little map with the north in the center and south being all directions away from the center and the frontier basically everywhere.
And yet we've been completely snowed and misled to believe that we live on a ball with no escape, which is just so much the opposite of the truth. So there you go. Eclipses. Done. Okay, cool. Hey, that's what I was going to say. Thanks, Bob. Excellent. Well, that's very informative, John. And, and you're right. I never really thought about, I'm going to have to think about, you know, that they should really only be taking place in between the tropics, but that does seem to make sense. Come on, Bob. Aren't you an engineer? Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Anybody else on the panel have comments about this? Anybody? Anybody? Hello? Somebody? Don't leave John swinging in the breeze like that. Okay. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, they were scrambling, you know, with the 2017 eclipse, we, you know, because uh, first it was, they had problems with the speed and then it was going the wrong direction. Who had problems? You mean you lot? And they had all these anomalies. And I don't know if, if those ever got really worked out. Um, Jaron, did, did anybody ever come up with an explanation for those anomalies for that eclipse that, that you heard that was satisfactory? No. Well, so... Uh, no. 2017 west to east i don't think it was going the wrong direction though I... oh a smart person and that was a sick bob burn that one i disagree with that yeah i modeled it and it seemed to be going the right direction to me but but your model is totally backwards so that's exactly what the globe earth predicted the flat earth would say you know curious jay has said that i'm wrong and he wanted to set up some experiment to show that it just hasn't come around yet but when i did it on my little iPad at the time, which I got the speed of the earth going the right way, the speed of the, and then recorded it and slow motioned it, then it was correct. That's what I showed. Jaron for the win. Good to see you got that one right, buddy. And so we're talking about like in terms of a ball earth, right? So we're still humoring the ball earth here. I agree. I think that it is entirely possible. So I don't think the west to east signature of the eclipse, I don't think that's a ball buster. Oh, John, that's no fun if you agree with Globe Earth. I think that's totally doable on the ball. I mean, I'm not saying the year is a ball. I just don't think that's not a battle that I would pick because it seems like it's doable to me as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When we're, you know, when Chris Van Matry came out here and we're sitting there looking at that black sun, you know, or that secondary sun, you know, that Wolfie said was, you know, because we didn't know how to operate the telescope, that really blew my mind because, again, yeah, reflections are polarized. And Bob, you forgot that Wolfie showed not just two suns, but three. He always has to go one better than you, doesn't he, Bob? That would never happen, not in a million years. And it was polarized, and it could be taken out by shifting polarity. So, I mean, we have all these little pieces of evidence. We just need to put them together in the correct way. Um, and I honestly believe that what actually causes the eclipses is some sort of other black body. A body, or, hear me out here, Bob, a blocking object that we call the moon. That is interfering either with the projection source, you know, which some people are saying coming up from the North Pole and then being somehow routed around, um, you know, optically by the firmament, well, to a few other things. But I think that there's more evidence for that than there is for what, you know, they how the mainstream describes eclipses. The heliocentric model does not predict eclipses, period. Uh, it was, the eclipses have always been uh, predicted by the Soros cycle and basically off of a flat type of projection. Well, yes, the cycles have been known for a long time, but the predictive power of the Globe Earth model has really been honed and refined since the late 60s, early 70s. Why? Because laser ranging to the moon has very accurately measured the distance and angles to the moon. Oh, and that ranging made possible because of the retro reflectors left there on the frickin' moon by NASA and the Soviets. Yeah, and Wally has one of them too. Cool, hey? Notice how the lens of the iPhone is always dead center. Yeah, <laughs> that is nuts. So, Well, they've you know, been predicted by, by observation, right? I mean, that's how they're all, always predicted. And, you know, if you apply the same sort of, um, it's like a stylus, right? You have the alignment between the sun, uh, earth, and moon. For the lunar eclipses, um, you, you run into similar problems. And, you know, I just, I, I lost my train of thought onto something that you had just mentioned I was going to comment on, and I just totally brain farted. But, um, uh, ah, shit, I'll probably think of it in a second. It'll I'm come sorry. back. I, didn't... I made yeah. a video about that. 
had yes you did Helios and it's a great video does not predict eclipses because it's it's true i went and show their website because they have nasa doesn't even take responsibility for the uh, information for the eclipse they tell you it's <clears> all get gotten from some guy called mr eclipse it's fred espinac or whatever his name is and then you go there and then you if you look down in the fine print of the website at all they get the how they predict their eclipses is it's all based off of what bob just said the sorrow cycle and ancient you know canons canons which is basically observations that are written down in texts over time yeah. that's exactly right the heliocentric model has no predictive capability in, in as far as eclipses whatsoever nasa doesn't eclipse uh, doesn't predict eclipses ever <laughs> so yeah that and they never have ago, we had like it was called the super wolf blood moon eclipse or something i did a video on it but I, I sat there and watched the whole thing and it was so bizarre because the the shadow of well we'll say the earth because we're talking about the ball earth model the, the shadow approached the moon like coming up into the left so it like you know, it hit the southeast corner of the moon first and then made its way up into the left until it hit totality. And according to the ball earth theory, you would expect it to continue in that direction, right? And uh, like, so that the, the, the shadow would continue up into the left until the moon was lit halfway, uh, light, light on the bottom right, and then continues up to the left. No, that's not what happened. It went up into the left, went in totality, and then went back down into the right. And I'm like, Okay, that doesn't work on a ball, and I think that uh, somebody much better with modeling things on a flat Earth could really glean some interesting information. It's it's a little above my head, but it was wow, like I couldn't believe it. Like how how could you know astronomy study eclipses for all of history and still think we live on a ball, right? I, I don't know, crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is nuts. Oh, and now here is the kill shot. Let's have a look at Andrew's work here. He set the telescope tracker to track the shadow. This makes it really easy for even the flattest of flat earthers to see with their own eyes just what's going on, because they all trust their senses, don't they? A massive earth-shaped shadow in the sky. And finally, not only is the moon able to be eclipsed, have you seen the eclipsing geostationary satellites that Wolfie and I have been doing observations for this last equinox and the one before? And these eclipses also require a particular alignment. These geostationary satellites are always in sunlight except for a few weeks either side of the equinox, when the Earth's shadow at midnight is straight above the equator, which is where the geostationary satellites are in orbit. So enjoy this while we see them blink out and blink back again. And finally, for my final kill shot, here is a solar eclipse from the ISS. Oh boy, well, that has been a massive effort. Sorry, it did get rather long, but it was so much fun slapping the Morgyle around a little bit. And of course, thanks Bob. Hope you enjoyed it, guys. Bye.